Eight o'clock on the nose. So let's begin. Thank you for your patience there while we figured out a few uh, technical hiccups going on. For those of you that don't know, my name is Dorian Deathly. I am a tour guide and educator here in the magnificent streets of York. I am usually found on what is known to be the York Ghost Bus. This is a lovely old Rootmaster bus that trembles around in the streets of York. And um, I talk about haunted goings on. I do some foot tours. I say foot tours, I don't tour people's feet. I walk around the streets of York on my feet. And um, I go to schools and etc., things like that. And um, yeah, I suddenly, because of the situation, found myself with a lot of time on my hands. And I decided, why not? Why not do something about it? And that something is this. You've joined me for what I think might be certainly my first live streamed tour of the streets of York. And hopefully yours as well. And we're going to be visiting some sites tonight of hauntings. We'll be visiting some sites of uh, some other awful goings on. I'll try and keep it light, you know, and 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 palatable, and friendly in these stressful times. And hopefully you'll enjoy yourselves. Now, I'll mention this once at the beginning of the tour, and I'll mention it again towards the end. This is entirely free. It's entirely free. Sit back, enjoy yourselves, let your kids watch. It's going to be family friendly. The PayPal is open. Should you wish to uh, chuck anything in, help with the tea and coffee fund. That'd be massively appreciated. Um, there's a paypal -y link thing somewhere on the page, paypal.me.doriandeathly, something like that. Um, if, 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 you, if you have enjoyed it at the end of it, have a look. We'll post something a little bit more relevant on there. But apart from that, I'm pretty sure that we're ready to begin. So I'm going to turn off my ugly mug, and I'm going to spin the camera around, and I'm going to welcome you all to the York Minster. Good old York Minster. Now, if you've ever been to York, you might know this is quite the landmark. It is quite the landmark indeed. People travel around the world to spend time with this magnificent old bird. She's quite impressive. She is quite impressive. And the question I want to ask at this point is, what are ghosts? What are ghosts? Whether you believe or you don't, whether you think that they're merely a trick of the mind or figment of the imagination. There's really something to be said for them. People genuinely have become obsessed and enamoured with the stories of ghosts and the rather peculiar and unexplained goings on over the years. They really ballooned in the Victorian times. Ghostly stories, people gathering in taverns and theatres to listen to tales of horror and misery and fright. You can even liken them to the, the works of, of people like Charles Dickens. You know, the Christmas Carol these days seems like this incredibly tame and fun and almost jovial Christmas tale of, 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 of Scrooge and the spirits that visit him. But in the olden days, it was genuinely terrifying. People would, like, sit in the theatre and just be absolutely horrified by the tales of this, this man's journey. You know, things that go bump in the night, the unexplained visions the bizarre goings-on, sightings that can't be explained. And before we get into the stories of the city of York tonight, I'm not just going to be talking about ghosts, I'm going to be talking about some of the rather interesting and uh, horrifically concerning points within our history of, well, there's a lot of stuff going on here. We're almost 2,000 years old of recorded history, let's not forget that. I want to tell you about the first encounter with the supernatural that I ever had. The sort of incident that started me on this journey, if you will. Now, it's an interesting one, this, because it actually rolls back to 1996. I was at a college in Scarborough at the time, and I was living, as most 16-year-olds are wont to do, with my mum, and she was working around the back of our house. Now, we lived in this old Victorian house in Scarborough, and she was doing some weeding around the back of the garden. It was about 11.30 in the morning, and unbeknownst to her, around this time, I became... I'd been quite ill. I actually had glandular fever, unknown to me. And I had a bit of a scare, a bit of a shock, a bit of a fright. And at that moment, when my health dipped, I don't want to dramatically say anything untoward was going to happen to me, my mum, Lord bless her, said that she saw me at home. She heard a scuffling sound behind her. She turned round to face me. And there I was stood. I was wearing the clothes that she'd seen me in that morning. And I stood and I looked at her and I smiled and I turned and I walked away. She was rather confused by this because at the time 
she knew I was supposed to be at college. I was supposed to be not at home. And she ran around the corner to see where I was, and I wasn't there. And it wasn't until that evening. I, I, I recovered, felt a bit ill, I came home. And she told me that she'd seen me, clear as day, clear as a bell. She saw me standing there in that garden. And she just held fast. And my mum's not like to say anything of this calibre. She's not, I would say, the sort of person that would make any bizarre claims to see something untoward. Um, but there I was, standing as clear as a bell, clear as day. A doppelganger, I found out later on, this is supposed to be. I, I've over the years researched all kinds of ghosts. I've read books of history. I've become somewhat obsessed with the supernatural. I've become somewhat obsessed with, indeed, the history of this magnificent old city that I live in. And on that note, further ado, we're going to begin. I'd like to welcome you all, first and foremost, to the tour. And we're going to begin here. If I can just flip this thing round. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. There we go. With the York Minster. There she is. There she is. So around essentially at the moment, I would say, what is the, arguably the side door, the front door, the main door. The thing is about this, this uh, lovely minster is it has a very interesting name. It's, 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 it's name, the York Minster, of course, is how it's known these days. Slightly longer and uh, less efficient name is actually the Cathedral and Metropical Church of the St. Peter in York. A bit of a mouthful, so we shortened it down to the York Minster. Let me begin its life as a small wooden structure here in York, 627, to baptise a local monarch by the name of King Egbert. Over the years it's been burnt down several times. I've got a long list of dates in my head, 637, 741, 1069, 1075. But there's a very interesting fire that actually took place here that was the result of arson, of all things, of arson. Yeah. You see, the 12th century came around and the Gothic architecture appeared. Now, and it's, it's very difficult to see, only the sort of lower area here is illuminated. A fellow by Walter de Grey took over as Archbishop, and he demanded that it would be redeveloped into this lovely church and cathedral that stands here today to rival that of Canterbury. Now, towards the end of the building in the 15th century, they got very, you know, happy with the way it was. They were very pleased with it. After several centuries of building and putting it together and strapping all the bits and pieces into place, they suddenly... things sort of slowed down and it existed as you can see it today. I'm just going to sort of take a little bit of a step back. Get as much of it in as I can. And we're going to jump ahead to 1829. A fellow by the name of Jonathan Martin. Now, Jonathan Martin attended an evening service at the Minster. And he became obsessed. He became absolutely convinced. He could hear this low, miserable droning sound. He could hear this awful whine emitting itself from the organ. It drove him to madness. So what he did was he hid himself inside of the tower of the Minster and he waited until night. He actually lit a small lantern so he could see his way through. And the night watchman working that night did say they saw a flickering flame but they decided not to investigate. And that very night he climbed down into the main body of the church, the cathedral, he set fire to it. Climbed out of a window, shrouded by smoke. People thought him scampering off into the night but here's the interesting thing. He wasn't the brightest bulb in the box, and he actually left letters and placards standing on the very steps that had his initials and his home address written at the bottom of them. Not, not the best move when you're trying to get away with burning down a lovely old building like this. Now he was of course charged, he was handed, we thought, the death penalty, but he was found insane instead. He served nine years in Bethlehem Royal hospital. And after he died, people started finding drawings and depictions of himself, of the old burning church, of scenes of apocalypse, the city of London. Almost like he was calling out premonitions of yesteryear. Now, I think that's enough history. We're not going to move on to the ghostly stuff, the terrible goings on. The Minster Ghosts begin in 1702, a fellow by the name of Dean Gale. Now, Dean Gale was an old caretaker. He loved this minster with all of his life. He said he had been working one evening late. Late in the highest point of the stone steps of the central tower. 275 steps all the way 
from the highest point down to the bottom. The next morning, Dean Gale's body was found at the bottom of the steps. People had suggested he'd lost his footing. He'd tripped, he'd slipped, he'd fell. He rolled and bounced all the way from the highest height down to the lowest lows. Now, if you've ever been to the top of the York Minster, 275 stone steps, you'll know this is very difficult. It's incredibly narrow, claustrophobic, there are harsh turns and bends. You're going to get caught on something, you're going to get snagged or ensnared. Dean Gale managed to roll his way all the way from the highest point, so high up in the shadows you can barely see it, all the way down to the very bottom. A few people have theorised over the years he had a helping foot, someone sort of nudging him along whenever he ground wetly to a halt. He's often seen sitting in the main pews, slightly translucent and greying form of a man, grinning wildly from ear to ear. His spirit loves the minster so much in life, he has refused to move on in death. That's something we're going to do. We're going to keep this thing rolling. We're going to make our way down now towards Minster Yard. This is Minster Yard, my friends. I know that's accurate because there's a sign around here somewhere that says Minster Yard. I can't find it right now, but trust me, it's up there. It's up there. Now, this ghostly story actually rolls back to the 1800s. There's a young woman and her partner walking along this road, heading towards the Minster, perhaps into town. And suddenly she felt a hand attach itself to her shoulder. She turned round and stared into the eyes of a face that she recognised. The face of her younger brother. Now, the interesting thing here is impossible for him to be there because he was actually serving overseas at the time. He leaned into her, whispered hoarsely into her ear, there is a future state, before turning, vanishing into the crowd. She found herself confused and turned around by this situation. She couldn't quite understand what she had seen, what she had heard. They tried to make contact with the authorities to find out if they knew anything about what had happened? Had the gentleman returned home? Had he lost his mind? And finally, two weeks later, they received note. Her brother had actually and tragically died at sea, fallen overboard, the body never recovered. Almost within the half hour of this incident, the spirit appeared to her. There is a future state. See, when they were younger, they'd made a promise to each other. Whoever was to go first would come back from the other side, let the other one know that there was indeed life after death. It's very kind, really, when you think about it. You know, you know. I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, but I uh, expire tragically. I probably have a lot going on. I'm probably okay. a lot to think about. You know, things to organise and take care of. But apparently, he found the time. He came back, informed her that there was indeed life after death. Very, very, very considerate. Very considerate. I think I'd probably be a little bit confused about what's going on. We're about to be attacked by small glowing objects, ladies and gentlemen. Now we're making our way down now towards a lovely little pub. A lovely little pub named, indeed, after a gentleman I'm almost certain that you may well have heard of. It'll be coming up here on our left-hand side in just a moment. I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. Currently uh, 138 of you watching, which is a bonkers number. Uh, if you do find the time to share this anywhere, post it into any groups, slap it on your Facebook, let people know what's going on. I'm basically doing this because I'm a tour guide, I'm suddenly unemployed and I've lost my mind and I just wanted something to do to kind of, you know, give back, entertain you all in these weird and peculiar times. So this here is the Guy Fawkes Inn. Uh, if you can see this down here, there's a lovely little inscription. I'm just going to ask Mrs. Deathly to bring the torch over. I'm going to point it at this little sign here. If you can see that there, just about making it out. It was here I was born. It is here where they serve the best pie in the city of York. I don't know if that's an actual quote from Guy Fawkes. Uh, I'm not sure if he was around when that was turned into a lovely little, lovely little pub that serves perhaps the best pies in York. But I'm certain you've all heard of Guy Fawkes. I'm certain it rings a bell. I'm absolutely certain it's a gentleman you've all probably heard of in some capacity. So I'm just going to switch the camera around here. Boop, boop. 
There we go. I'm getting smoother at that every time I do it. Every single time I do it. Now, Guy Fawkes, born and raised here in the streets of York. Chances are you've heard of him. Guy Fawkes, Guido Fawkes, or John Johnson is the name you want to go by. Now, these days it's an odd one because we all tend to celebrate a certain day in the year. Really kind of caused by the madness that he did. I'm not going to go into the big old history about it all. All you need to know, Guy Fawkes started it all here in our magnificent old city. Now, I'm not sure if there's enough light on this. I'm going to flip it around again. Oh, there we go. That's better, actually. This here is St. Michael Belfry. This is where Guy Fawkes was baptised all the way back in 1605. Oh, hang on. 16... No, wait, wait. 1570. 1570. I'm getting ahead of myself there. Getting ahead of myself there. He died in 1606, aged 35. Now... It's believed that he was actually born in this little pub just over the road there. So, baptised there, born there. That's Andy, straight over the road, no fuss, no fuss at all. Now, of course, we all know he was arrested for the gunpowder plot on the 5th, uh, 5th of November, all those years ago. Now, the torture was ordered upon him by the king at the time, good old King James. The torture that was handed down was et sic per gradus ad ima tenditur, which translates roughly as... And so, by degrees, proceeding to the worst. What this meant was that they started off by putting him in manacles and poking at him a little bit, and then they elevated the, uh, the torture to, to, to the rack. Now, when they got the confession out of him, I'm afraid to say it was an awful, awful scribble. Their handwriting was barely recognisable as his own. Yeah. If you look online, you can go on the internet, you can actually see an example of his actual signature compared to the one that he put on his confession letter all those years ago. Now he was actually marched out there, or drawn as it was. Oh, look at this. That's exciting. I should get one of those. Stuff walking. I need one of those things. That's fantastic. What a time to be alive. Three other men, co-conspirators, were actually dragged out there at the same time. And they went first. That's the worst thing to remember here. His co-conspirators were hanged, drawn and quartered right in front of his eyes, before he was. Shocking way to go. Now, after undergoing all this torture, after undergoing this agonising final moments of his life, this is all down in London, remember? He was born and raised here, went over, fought in Spain underneath the name of Guido Fawkes, then it was apprehended, and he called himself John Johnson. That's one of my favourite things about Guy Fawkes, actually, is that when he was apprehended, they asked him what his name was, and he said... Hello, they call me John Johnson, which is like the worst fake name, quite frankly, I've ever heard. I've never heard a fake name quite as rubbish as that one. But he was tortured for a few days, hanged, drawn, and quartered. He watched three of his friends go first, at which point he decided, it's not for me, actually. I might skip this one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start to climb the ladder towards the gallows. I'm going to do a sweet backflip off the ladder, land on my head, break my neck. Now, the thing is, a show is a show. That's the thing to remember here. The show is a show. People had turned out for it by their thousands. Executions at the time were essentially public entertainment. And people gathered in their thousands to watch him go. And suddenly they had a lifeless Guy Fawkes on their hands. And they didn't quite know what to do with the situation. So they just kind of brushed themselves off and carried on regardless. It just kind of went ahead, hanging, drawing and quartering the body as it slowly began to cool and fidget and twitch. Now, the thing is, if you don't know much about hanging, drawing and quartering, it's a particularly horrendous way to go. We did do it here in York quite a lot, but we weren't very good at it. Because the thing is, you've got to hang them by the neck till they're nearly dead, right? Then you've got to cut them down. You've got to make sure they're still alive and fidgeting and breathing. You've got to cut them open, peel back all the... Uh, open up the... Uh, and just start pulling out everything you can find. Just start dragging out all the bits and pieces. What they're going to do towards the end is they're going to slit your throat. They're going to chop off your head. Pop it on a spike. Lovely. Cut your body into four pieces and post it to the four corners of the kingdom. Now, they would do this. They would bury your body in its four newly quartered bits all around the country in unmarked graves. The idea was that you would not be able to rest. Your spirit would not be able to find peace. Pretty messed up, right? Pretty messed up indeed. Oh, good old Guy Fawkes, though. Proper northern lad. Proper northern lad. Never, never without an idea. Rather than allow himself to be humiliated and executed publicly, did a flip off a ladder. Lights out in a heartbeat. Absolute legend. Now, we're just approaching now St. Leonard's Place. This Lord 
area, the, the Theatre Royal coming up around the corner. You have to excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very cold out here. It is really a lot colder than I had anticipated. I'm just going to wait to cross the road here. So I don't want to venture too far down St. Leonard's Place because I'm actually going to be going this way towards Lendl. So I just want to be able to see the theatre a bit and then we'll make our way on towards the libraries and Lendl Bridge. Now it's just there poking around the corner. Do you know what? We're just going to, we'll take a little further wander down just to go. Not the best view of it here, so I'm going to make my way down here towards it. Now, this is the York Theatre Royal, and it's perhaps home, I believe, to one of the most famous ghosts in the entire city of York, the Grey Lady. Now, it's so famous that we've even got a gin named after them. Shout out to York Gin there. I'll be probably doing a few hollers, as the kids say, to uh, small indie businesses. As I make my way around, I've all been affected by the situation that's currently unfurling. Now, this is somewhere that is on our bus route. This is somewhere we normally come down. You've got there, Julie Gate, heading down towards Booth and Bar, York St. John University. But this here is the Theatre Royal of York. Lovely old Theatre Royal. Now, this dates back 275 years. I do apologise about the traffic sound. We won't hang around on any main roads for too long. It's actually built on top of the original foundations of St. Leonard's Church Hospital Hospice. We'll be visiting the main site of that a little bit later on. You can see examples of the original Gothic architecture dating back olden times. There are small parts of that area inside that building where you can actually stand on top of glass blocks and look down at the original foundation stones dating back nearly 900 years. It's crazy, absolutely ludicrous. What I love about York what I love about working here as a tour guide is that everything is pretty much still here. You know, I'm not pointing at there's a proté manger built on top of an old haunted nun house. Nun house? A nunnery. That's the real word. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's all still here. It's all still there. And normally what I do is a lot more controlled and scripted than this. I'm kind of out riffing wildly uh, with people wandering behind me going, this man's a lunatic. Who's he even talking to? But yes, the Theatre Royal of York. Two ghosts inhabit this space. The Grey Lady of York is one of them. Now, she was a nun, and she committed a sin that nuns certainly aren't allowed to do. Oh, I've pressed something weird. One moment, everybody. Yeah, da, 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 da. Fingers are no longer working. Oh, there we go. Double tap that. Yeah, there we go. That's better. Now, there we go. That's where it's at. There's the theatre there. So, the lovely old theatre, the Grey Lady of York. Now, she was a nun. And as I say, she committed a sin that nuns really aren't supposed to do. But the old, uh, but the old rumpety pumpety, but the old argy bargy, but the old, you know, some of that slap and tickle. Didn't do it once, didn't do it twice. Some people say that this lovely old nun made a habit out of it. No regrets, absolutely no apologies. Be prepared for dad jokes. There's going to be loads of them. Now, for her crimes, they actually threw her into a stone room, and then they are said to have bricked up the only doorway behind her. There was no windows, no way out. She unfortunately and tragically died alone in the darkness. Now, we know that she's still in there somewhere. Over the years, they have rejuvenated and reinvigorated the site. They have done their very, very best to make it the modern brilliance that it is today. But there has been a few odd goings on. People say that they see figures, hooded robes, moving around in the corridors. They hear a coarse, ragged whisper, let me out, over the headsets. They have said to have often heard... number six bus right there not a ghost real bus they do say that the old uh, stones that she was buried in all those years ago have left a sign of resonance behind you see they say that they often see ooh, people out running for fun look at that look at that let's go wait for this bus to trundle by there we go yeah we're gonna get off the main road it's not really working out too well here it's gonna cross over here So as I was saying, they hear dry, brittle fingernails scraping at the inside of the walls. They hear her whisper tumbling out into the night. She's one of the most famous spirits in the city of York. Yeah, very tragic, very tragic. They never found the body, that's the thing. Never found the body, even after all these years. Still in there somewhere, still in there somewhere, they say. And another ghost that I actually only learned about today, a little bit of uh, extra reading over the last couple of days to prepare myself for this madness and um, there is a spirit of York known simply as the dandy the dandy I love this 
Now, the story goes that this gentleman is seen wearing very elaborate clothing, standing at the side of the stage during rehearsals. And he wears these very flamboyant, rich and wealthy looking clothes. And he has a big ring that he flaunts around wildly. Now, it's said that he was actually killed in a duel on Blake Street, which isn't far from where we're currently at now. And the very moment that the pistol was fired, his spirit flashed suddenly into being. He's like... been there for a very, very long time indeed. Very odd indeed. Now, we're just going to arrive here. We're going to tuck ourselves in ever so slightly. And if you can see this. Again, it might be a spot too dark. But this here to my... to my right, this is the Yorkshire Library. Now, 1594, the Yorkshire Post wrote a story on Mr. G. F. Wilmot. He was the uh, custodian of the old museum that used to stand around these parts. And he actually resigned because he demanded an investigation be launched into the supernatural goings-on that were occurring around these old parts. And this just here is uh, more of St. Leonard's. We'll be visiting that site in a little while. But just here, the library itself. There's a caretaker by the name of G. L. Jonas, and every fourth Monday, over 12 weeks, he reported the same thing happening. He kept saying that this book was being launched across the aisles and the stacks. Same book, they would replace it. Same time, four weeks down the road, it would happen again. They actually brought in some local investigators because at the time they maybe suspected Mr. Jonas had been a little bit drunk. So they brought in a local uh, solicitor and a doctor, thinking as they were men of great respect. They would perhaps add a little bit of weight to the suspicions. They saw it happen as well. But because they refused to do it, they actually flat out caused the old custodian to quit. And upon his departure, it is said that, that book immediately stopped flying off the shelves. Very odd. Clearly there was something in there that wasn't very happy with the old caretaker and custodians. Very strange, very strange indeed. Now we're coming down now to Museum Street. Museum Street, if you've ever been to York, you might know this area. We're going to start moving into the city centre in a little while. Museum Street here, just Lendl Bridge just down there in front of us. But here to our behind Yorkshire Museum Gardens. Very cleverly named because they're a garden in Yorkshire with a museum in. Brilliant. Couldn't write these things. St Mary's Abbey lurks in the back here. Now the gardens themselves, absolutely magnificent. I'm not sure if you can see much behind me here. Down here, that'll do, that'll do nicely. Now the gardens opened in the 1830s and it was actually opened by the uh, Yorkshire Philosoph Phil Philosophical, the Yorkshire Philosophical Society and the, uh, the, uh, the Yorkshire Museum itself. Now there are remains of St. Leonard's Church and Hospital just here. And if you can just see these, I'll just, I'll just spin the camera around again. Uh, 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 uh. There we go. You can just maybe see a few of them just poking out through the trees here. And these are open to the public when the gardens are open. Of course, you can make your way down through there. You can have a little bit of a wander through into the darker, shadower -y bits. Now this whole area is said to be haunted by a fellow known simply as the Black Abbot of York. He was an abbot back in the olden times, and it is said that he was murdered for his gambling debts. He was actually apprehended by his debtors in the gardens, and he was stabbed to death in an incredibly violent manner. People making their way into the gardens on a cold, dark night, just like tonight, sometimes say they see an impossibly tall man approaching them from far off distance, wearing a thick, dark woolen robe, his feet curled and gnarled in behind. And he gets closer and closer and closer, and suddenly he's no longer there. It's not like he disappears or he fades away. It's just that he was there, he was there, and then suddenly, suddenly he's not. Very, very strange. They find themselves transplanted elsewhere. They were in the gardens here, minding their own business, and suddenly they're near the shambles. They're near the Minster. They're near Whitmer Watmergate. All places that we're going to visit or have visited in the tour tonight. They've ended up here. Might as well just talk about this. This is Lendl Bridge. We won't be going all the way over Lendl Bridge because we're going to make our way down here in a moment towards the Stonegate area of York. But this is Lendl Bridge. Now these little lamps here, of course, would have been gas-powered back in the olden days. Electricity now, slightly less flammable, which is good, which is good. And in 1861, they actually built the first version of Lendl Bridge, which collapsed during construction. 
This is one of my favourite areas of York because this little slipway here is actually called Dame Judy Dench Walk. Because you may or may not know this, but the lovely, lovely Dame Judy herself, she was born here in the city of York and she was part of an amateur dramatics company for some years before finding huge success in such wonderful films like Cats the Musical. The less said about that one, the better, I think. But the bridge itself, the first version, was built in 1861 and it fell in! It actually fell in halfway through construction before it was even finished with five workmen strapped to the underneath. Now those gentlemen died immediately. They are known to us now as the lost labourers of Lendl Bridge. They're often seen sitting on the opposing side of the banks. If you were to make your way down Lendl Bridge here, if you were to make your way down Dame Judy Dench Walk, you can just make out the old slipway there opening up towards the River Ouse, otherwise known as the River Water. We're very good at naming things here in York. You might actually catch a glimpse of five workmen sitting on the opposing side of the river, grinning and laughing and cheering, having a wonderful time of it all. Yeah, their spirits are incredibly high when you consider the fact that they've been dead for some years. I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, but if I've been working on the underneath of a bridge in the Victorian times, to then have the bridge construction fail for my body to be ejected down into the violently icy black cold waters of the River Ouse, to then have a giant bridge land on top of me, I would probably be a little bit upset about the situation, but that's just me. That's just me. Now, we're going to take a little breather now, not from me waffling, but just from the stories. We're going to make our way up past Judge's Lodgings here, round towards uh, Stonegate of York, where we'll be meeting the old, few old taverns. We've got 35 Stonegate, which is said to be the most haunted building in the entire city of York. Mrs. Deathly there, loyally following behind. Very surreal indeed. Now, for those of you who don't know, Mrs. Deathly here uh, is plugged into the internet. She's listening to the stream. Probably very uh, discombobulating for her because I think she can probably hear me talking in real time and she can also hear me talking about 10 seconds later because the stream uh, isn't entirely constant, truth be told. But, you know, needs must, needs must, and she's doing the good work. Round of applause for Mrs. Deathly, ladies and gentlemen. Woo! 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 So yes, once again, as we make our way around towards Stonegate, if you, uh, if you can share this stream anyway, just get a few more people involved. Let's see what we're doing. How are we going for numbers? Uh, oh Lord, 165 of you. That's bonkers. Do like the page. Do like the old Facebook page, uh, because hopefully once all this uh, madness blows over, I will be back out in some capacity, be it wandering the streets, be it doing maybe things like this. Maybe this is, uh, maybe this is the future of tour guiding in York. Maybe he's slightly more concerned. There's a fellow over there. He's having a good time. He's making his kebabs look. Whoop, whoop. Delivery. Delivery. Oh, Middle Feast, York, delivery. Open delivery. for delivery. Delivery, What's delivery. What's that? What's that? Middle Feast, open till very early in the morning. Get yourself a kebab. Why not? Why not? What a plug. What a hero to be. So we're just making our way around the corner now towards Stonegate of York. Ah, this is really well lit. That is good news indeed. Marvellous, marvellous, marvellous. So we're going to make our way up towards the Old Star Inn. Now what I like about the Old Star Inn is that they have a wild abundance of letters. They have the word Old, O-L-D-E. They have Star, S-T-A-R-R-E. And then Inn with I-N-N-E. So loads of extra E's and extra N's for your hearing pleasure. Betty's Tea Room's there. Of course, that's a landmark here in York. If you ever do find yourself in York in the future, not tomorrow maybe, not for a little while, then uh, Betty's Tea's. Absolute landmark. You'll often see people queuing hundreds deep just to get in there. It's absolutely wonderful. Well, we went, actually recently, didn't we? We went, we had a, a small gift card was uh, given to us for our recent wedding and, um, or was it Christmas? Is it Christmas or wedding? It's Christmas, one of the two, one of the two, both equally magnificent. And uh, we, we ate everything. There was nothing left. They had to close after we'd been in. Oh, this is surreal. This is very strange. So normally on a night, Stonegate is absolutely I wouldn't say heaving with people because York goes to sleep at seven o'clock, but you know, obviously a lot more people than this are normally here. But we're making our way up towards the old star inn, and I don't know if you can see it, but it's just the sign for it is just, just starting to come into view there. I'm just going to walk a little bit quicker to get us there a little bit faster. The old star inn. Now as we're running up towards it, a bit of information about it. Earliest mention of the old star inn is 1644. It's said to be very haunted indeed. Now people report chairs moving across the carpets, they hear doors slamming, lights flickering and flashing. 
There were strange cries and noises, keeping the land lord and landlady awake. And back in the Civil War, the cellar was actually used as a morgue and a triage hospital for surgery. And people say they hear the sounds and screams of the old soldiers begging for it to end. 300 years down the line, a soldier wrote a letter to his beloved in World War I, promising to meet in the old Star Inn when the old dust had settled, when he returned home from war. Never made it. Never made it. And she's said to have died of a broken heart not long after. Now, the old Star Inn is here, and it lurks just through, just through this little alleyway here. And unfortunately, this is as close as we're going to get tonight because, like all pubs, it is sadly closed. Very sad indeed. Now, these spirits of the uh, heartbroken pair are often seen moving around in the bar, searching for each other, desperately, desperately wanting to be reunited. Now, even though almost a hundred years has passed, they still haven't found each other, which is incredibly upsetting. Now, this is a story that, as a cat owner and cat lover, probably distresses me the most out of anything that I do speak to you about tonight. People say they see black cats running around inside of this building. They see two cats scampering around in the corner of their eye. They turn the face and there's nothing there. The story goes that in the olden times, people would actually entomb living cats inside of the walls near the fireplaces to protect against fire and flame. Dogs are said to snarl at the point where this has happened. And there was even an incident about 20 years ago where a dog ran at the wall that is believed to contain these cats and knocked itself unconscious. They see figures sitting in the lower seating. People spot it out of the corner of their eye, they turn to face it, there's nothing there a second time. And the one that I really don't like is that young children often see an odd shape of a, a, a slightly twisted old woman clambering her way up a staircase, only ever spotted by the younger people within the tavern. Now we're going to come off Stonegate now. We're going to make our way into Coffee Yard. I'm just going to ask Mrs. Deathy what the time is. It is 20.38. 20, 38, really? 40 minutes? That's crazy. I was worried we didn't have enough to talk about, but I'm obviously waffling on inanely. But here we are. So just up there is uh, 35 Stonegate. That's an interesting one. In the olden days, I said the olden days, about 10, 15 years ago, there was actually a, a place called Haunted York up there. Uh, is a residence that dated back to 1482. Proven habitation there of a thousand years ago. It was purchased by a fellow named Jonathan Kainer back in 1999. Uh, builders disturbed something during the renovations and they actually unearthed something, it is said. Because until that point, 35 Stonegate had reported a few hauntings. They'd seen a few spirits moving around in the corridors and suddenly, out of nowhere, dozens of them apart, just began to appear, including a very peculiar apparition. A fellow known simply as Tom or Tall Tom. An incredibly tall fellow. He wears a uh, distinct black outfit and a long, tall hat. And they actually, at one point, had the seance room operating in 35 Stonegate. You could go in there and you could actually attempt a seance right there and then. You could just have a little go at it. I, I actually went there about 10 years ago when I first, 10, 15 years ago when I first came to York and um, actually had a go. And it wasn't very, it was a very, very peculiar place indeed. Now, you might have noticed, friends, that we're getting into the dark stuff now. I'd like to welcome you to a Snickleway. Now, if you're not familiar with what a Snickleway is, three very Yorkshire words, Snicket, Ginnel, and Alleyway. Snicket, Ginnel, and Alleyway. We took them together, we squashed them in, and we made a Snickleway. Now, with the Snickleways of York, this is Coffee Yard. This is the longest Snickleway. It's 220 yards. It runs its way past off Stonegate towards the city centre, towards richer sounds, past Barley Hall, and it's a magnificent example of the old streets, the old twisty-turny ones. Now, these are a bit odd. It is advised that you don't do these on your own late at night because of a spirit known simply as the Bar Guest of York. Now, if you're not familiar with the Bar Guest of York, lucky you. Unfortunately, I'm about to change your world. Oh, look at this. Magnificent. If you can see up there, there's a face of an owl. 200 people. Oh, we've reached 200 people in the stream. That's magnificent. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for turning in. That's really, really appreciated. Really appreciated. This is helping me remain sane during these mad times. Now, the Bar Guest of York otherwise translates 
ghost or guest. Guest was the original trans translation, uh, translation, pronunciation. That's the word I'm trying to say. The original pronunciation. Just again, it's very cold out here. I'm starting to, I'm starting to sniff horrifically. Um, they actually pronounced it guest back in the olden days. And bar guest comes from either the old saying town ghost or the Germanic bear guest or bar guest or bear ghost. Now, it is said to appear as an image of an incredibly large black dog with blood red eyes. People making their way through the snickerways of York often encounter this odd sensation as if they've been followed, as if they've been judged, as if they've been watched. Now it is said if the bar guest pushes its way past you and you find yourself tottering out of the way, you'll feel an immense sensation of relief as if the bar guest has departed as if it has pushed its way past you and you are safe to go about your business. If it follows you home, this sensation, if you make your way all the way through the Snickleway, all 220 yards to the other side, you're still going to feel as if it's there. Unfortunately, things are not going to go well for you at all. It's said that you are cursed, you are marked by the bar guest itself. This dog would often appear during... Funerals of wealthy and important individuals will be followed along by a procession of other dogs howling and barking horrifically as if something very bizarre was about to unfurl. If you get in the way of the bar guest, if you try to confront it, it is said to mark you. To mark you with a claw or a wound that will never heal. And that brings us out through Coffee Yard to Stonegate. Now one of the things I really like about the old Snickleways of York is that for someone of my height look at that bam, bam, absolutely going to clap myself on the head really bad. I've got to actually stoop down and back it up to get through there. Very, very strange indeed. Very strange indeed. Mrs. Deathly, I could hear myself then. That was very off-putting. Suddenly I was like blah, 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 blah. Uh, so this is Grape Lane. We're on Grape Lane now. Uh, home to, quick shout out there, that's 1331 restaurant up there and the Cheese Trader. In York, my friends, we have an entire shop dedicated to cheese. And I couldn't be more proud of this fact. If you do find yourself in York in the future, please do pop down to Grape Lane. Now, Grape Lane's an interesting one because I'd love to tell you what the original translation of Grape Lane was, but I can't because it's too rude. Great Plain was a hive of, let's say, ladies of the night. Let's go with that. It was a, um, it was a hot spot of prostitution and a bit of the old, you know, financial transactions for a little bit of the old, the old slap and tickle, etc., etc., etc. The original translation, I'm gonna, I've got it written down in here. Uh, I've got a little, little notebook that I've been referring to at a few points tonight because I'm going off the beaten track quite a lot here. I don't normally talk about these parts of York, but it's been a very good education. Uh, first word of a three-worded street name was Grope, and then there was another word, and it was Lane. Now, the closest I'm daring to give you is, at one point, it was known as Grope Count Lane, and that is as close to the sun as I am willing to fly, ladies and gentlemen. No more than that. Now, around just through the other side here, past these buildings, is uh, Low Petergate. I was going to go down there, but I've realised that I've been banging on for quite a bit, so I'm just going to skip that bit out, and I'm going to go straight to a part of York that I have no doubt is the one that you're probably the most excited to encounter. If you're going to come to York and visit our fair city, then chances are this is going to be something on your list to do. This is going to be one of the places you can go. You might just be able to make up behind me here. I think I'm on the right street. I mean, you've got the lights on. There is sometimes a view of the York Minster behind me, but I don't think at the moment... No, I'm not even on the right street. It's, it is in that direction, but it's one street over where you get a little bit of a view of it. Now we're going to make our way down. We're going to go over Church Street past Swine Gate. Ooh, quick thing while we're making our way through. If you're ever in York, you'll notice a lot of our streets are actually named something something gate. Something gate, something something gate. Gates is an old word. And it means street. It literally translates gate equals street. Easy as that. It's normally something to do with something nearby street. Yeah, something nearby street. So let's go for example, uh, 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 
Julie Gate. Julie Gate. That's near the Theatre Royal. Julie Gate used to have an old church at the end of it, uh, which was a huge plague pit back in the 1600s. Three and a half thousand dead, all buried in the same spot. Julie Gate, Giles Street. Simple as that. There's loads of them all over the place. Collier Gate, High Peter Gate, Low Peter Gate, Middle Gate, Monk Gate, Swine Gate, Skelder Gate. The list goes on. So here we go. If you ever walk around York, Gate equals Street. But we're now approaching King's Square. King's Square and, of course, the shambles of York. So I think you've seen my ugly mug long enough. And we're going to make our way around here into the shambles of York. Now, I mentioned the bar guest earlier on, and I do love this. There's a little shop here on the shambles that is called Bar Guest. Genuinely love it. So the shambles. There we have it. Oh, look at the state of that. Look at the actual state of the place. Ladies and gentlemen, the shambles of York. I genuinely believe one of the most beautiful places in the entire world. It is deserted, but don't let that fool you. It's normally like this. When I bring people around here, it's about eight o'clock at night when I do the ghost tours, and it normally looks exactly like this. There's a handful of people dotted around, if that. We've got all manner of shops, old-fashioned sweet shops. You've got the, uh, the Ghost Merchants here, which is a magnificent store. I do mention it nightly on my tour. The Ghost Merchants is a Victorian idea. Now, the idea here is, is, it, is it fortune and fortitude, I believe is they're saying? Fortune and fortitude. And I don't know if you can see them. I think they probably have clear... Oh, no, the shelves are all there on the shelves. Lovely, lovely little people. Tiny little ghosts. You can take home a ghost in a box. Maybe there's one of them just about there. Look at that. Ghost in a box. Beautiful. Absolutely adorable. They're all handmade up there in the higher reaches. Absolutely fantastic. Now, there's an interesting spirit actually attached to this place, known simply... Well, it's an odd one, because we're not entirely sure who she is, where she comes from. All we know is that she attaches herself to the weights of York in the olden days. Now, long before the internet, long before news and social media, the way that people would let people know that things were going wrong here in the streets of York was with music. The weights of York would literally walk up and down the streets of York playing music to alert people, to let people know that everything was going okay, that there were no problems. If you heard the music of the Waits of York, it meant that everything was all right, and you didn't need to panic, you could keep yourself tucked away at night, and it would be absolutely fine. At some point during their performances here in York, they started to notice that they were being followed by a woman wearing a white dress, and she would dance and twirl and spin and pirouette, and it wasn't long before she just became a part of the scenery. And one day she just disappeared. Now, even to this very day, people wandering around the shambles, they often say that they see a glimpse of a piece of white fabric suddenly disappearing through a snickleway, through an alleyway, into a door, almost as if she's still here dancing within our wonderful streets to this very day. Now, the shambles of York these days, as you can see, is absolutely magnificent and it's beautiful. Well, it wasn't always the case. There was a point here when this lovely street with this incredible array of restaurants and bars and fantastic independent shops was not quite as pleasant. It was butcher's shops. It was 25 butcher's shops all the way from the bottom to the top. And every single one of them sold meat of some description. They would simply rip the flesh from the animal carcass and park it on the outside of the windows for the good old people of York to essentially rub themselves. And now we are approaching a little shop now by the name of Hebden Tea. It's just here. This is one that I talk about on a nightly basis because it's got a lovely old wooden shelf just poking out of the front of it there. And they would put all of their meat on display. They would hang carcasses from the meat hooks. They would simply hurl the meat out into the street. Somebody else will deal with it. Somebody else's problem. They would simply hurl and discard all of the urine and the feces and the offal just out into the street. Now the abattoirs or the slaughterhouses were in the middle windows. The shops would be down on the lower ones, leaving of course rooms to rent. Nice and high. They were cheap because smells rise. You were living above a slaughterhouse. They would simply hurl it out into the street. All of the waste 
would ooze and trickle its way down this street, ultimately to park itself outside the front door of Greg's. There's a massive Greg's down at the bottom of the shambles. I believe it was added with a sense of irony. Ooh, no. A little snickle way there. Now this one's a bit of an interesting one, very quickly. This is uh, one part of Whitmer-Watmergate. Whitmer-Watmergate, one of the most fantastically named streets in New York. It's very short, it literally starts around the corner, it comes through here. Translates into uh, my favourite one, neither here nor there street, which is fantastic, because it's literally about 12 metres long. Americans based here in the Second World War just started calling it Walla Walla Gate because they couldn't be asked to pronounce it properly. Thanks Americans, lovely stuff indeed. And we've arrived at the Crux Courtyard. We won't be here for too long. This whole area is where I've stood night after night after night for the last six years of my life. This is very surreal for me to be standing here right now with your good selves. Hello there, hello there. If you've ever joined me for one of my ghost bus tours before, you'll know that this is one of the bits where I get everybody off the bus. We have a little bit of a wander around to see what's going on. Because it stands here at the bottom of the shambles, we've got the old parish hall of the crux behind me there, and then just over the road we have the Golden Fleece of York, dating back to 1503, said to be one of the most haunted pubs in the entire city of York, if not the entire country. Now I'm just gonna flip this round. I'm not entirely sure that you'll be able to see it in the darkness. There we go. Well, there you go, marvellous. Just about between the Greggs there and between York Gin. That is the Golden Fleece of York. In fact, let's get a little bit closer to it. Let's cross over the road and see what we can see. Like all the pubs, of course, it's currently shrouded in darkness, which is very sad. But it'll be back in no time. We will prevail. The streets of York will thrive once again. And I'll be able to tell everyone about these horrible, miserable goings on and hauntings and whatnot. So, over we go. The Golden Fleece of York, here she is. Now, the Golden Fleece of York prides itself on being an incredibly haunted pub. Got the old sheep there, I don't know if you can see much of him, just poking up down over the road. Haunted, they say, by between 5 to 15 ghosts. Now, that's an interesting one. That is a number that was presented to us by an incredibly talented gentleman, a fellow you may have remembered, sadly left us at the end of last year. The old, most haunted, the legend that was, Derek Okora. He spent a few nights in there when we left. We asked him how many ghosts he believed to inhabit. He replied between 5 to 15, which is an incredibly large margin for error. Now, my favourite ghost is that of a fellow named Jeff Monroe. Jeff Monroe was actually a ghost, or is a ghost now, I should say. It's the fuzz. Nobody move. It's the fuzz. I should wait for this van to go by. Noisy boy. Oh, he's showing off, look. Now, Jeff Munro was a Canadian airman who parachuted down into York. Now, this is an interesting one because his ghostly tale actually has a couple of origins. And it's up to you which one you'd like to believe. Now, the one I've heard is, oh, security lights, that's very bright. Jeff Munro, the first story I heard was that he was actually sorting his boots out while sitting on a window. Uh at the very highest point of the Golden Fleece, and he said that he lost his balance and he tumbled backwards, he fell out of the window and broke his neck. And the second story that I was told was that he parachuted into York during the Second World War, and he got entangled in his own parachute cords after crashing through the roof tiles of the Golden Fleece. Before they could actually drag him free from the rafters, he became so entangled in the ropes and the ties that he actually hanged himself on the staircase. People making their way towards the higher rooms of the Golden Fleece do say that they often see a pair of well-kept military booties fidgeting and twitching around, performing what is known as the hangman's jig. Now, another spirit is that of a little man running away, terrified past the Marks and Spencer's food hall. See him move, how fast was that guy? Zoom! <laughs> So, uh, yeah, uh, th this area, actually, before we go any further, this was actually used for executions back in the olden times. This is pavement of York, uh, and this was used for the wealthy, the rich. People with a bit of money in the pocket would often be brought down here to be executed by the means of hangman's blade, the Halifax gibbet, which was a sort of precursor to the, uh, the guillotine that we all know and love so much. Just around there. That car's currently zooming towards us. Probably get out of the way. There's an interesting little story of a young lad. Now, they've got him simply listed on the outside of the Golden Fleece as small child. But I've called him Jeremy. Because I think since he's been in York for several hundred years, he deserves a first name. Now, he said that he was killed by a runaway horse 
at the bottom of the shambles. It ran away from a flesh market, went straight over the top of him, and sadly, sadly, took his life. And he now stands in the middle window of the Golden Fleece, looking down at the lowest point of the shambles, replaying his death over and over again, around and around and around, known as a death echo or a shade. A shade of his former self echoing his death for all of time. And the story even goes further. It's said that when the gentleman was decapitated there with such ferocity, the axman's blade swung so harshly that the head jettisoned itself off the torso and missed the basket. A small child is said to have grabbed the head and passed it back up to the executioner, kind of like, do you want your ball back? Absolutely outrageous. Youths, youths, absolutely staggering. I'm just going to flip around again because we've arrived here at the Church of All Saints and Pavement. Now, here's the thing. This magnificent old church is actually said to have been constructed around the 14th century. And it is said that there are indeed 34 Lord Mayors of York buried underneath that there very church. Now this is something you can't really escape here in York, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a second. You've got the lantern there on the top of it. It's visible throughout the entire city. It's one of the most beautiful pieces of architecture within the entire city of York. It stands here at the bottom of Coney Street, which as you can see at the moment is absolutely isolated. For years of my life, I've seen a small kebab van just around there. Just a little tiny kebab van around there, but unfortunately now no longer standing. Oh, what dark times these are indeed. Now, the toll in York here is said now to be over half a million, if not 600,000 and climbing, as if the streets of York are slowly going to begin to up, heave and rise their way due to the congestion. And when you hear that number, half a million dead, you think, well, that's outrageous, scandalous. There can't possibly be that many dead people underneath the streets of York. But then you do the maths. You have to remember, my friends, we have over the years since we started recording history back in 71 AD when the Romans arrived. And of course, there was stuff going on here long before then as well. People have over the years encountered Roman invasions, Anglo-Saxons, Normans, Vikings, uh, two world wars. We've been the capital city of executions for a thousand years. We've had outbreaks of the Black Death, of cholera, of, of typhus, six outbreaks of the bubonic, the pneumonic, the septicemic plague. It's suddenly not that scandalous to imagine that so many people have lost their lives and had to, of course, be buried somewhere underneath the streets of York. It's the price we pay for this magnificent and rich old history. And we're making our way down now towards the Coppergate area of York. Now, if you've ever been to York, chances are you know where we are about to go. This Coppergate walk, Coppergate, the Coppergate shopping centre. And normally during the day, you can't move for people here. Over the last couple of days, I've seen photographs. This is the first time I've actually been out of the house. <gasps> In a little while, oh, what lovely timing that is. Is the bell. Of the Church of All Saints tolling. How good is that? I thought we got stuck then. I thought we were just going to keep going forever and ever and ever and ever. Just going to hover around here. So there we have the. Church of All Saints and Pavement behind me. 240 of you watching, that's outrageous. Don't forget to like the page, friends. Like the page. If this has gone down well, I might do a, another one in a week or two's time, if we're still allowed out. I mean, we'll see how things go, but we're making our way down now onto Coppergate of York, the Coppergate Walk. Now, if you've ever been to York and you've ever been to the Jorvik Viking Center, that's where we're currently approaching. The Vikings, of course, arrived in York in 866 AD, and they pretty much murdered all of the Anglo-Saxons that were settled here in the original town of Efevik. Over the years, we've been known by many things. We've been known as Eber Arkham when the Romans were here. We've been known as Efevik with the Anglo-Saxons. We've been known as Jorvik because of the Vikings. We were once known as Yerk with an E, Y-E-R-K. Hey, and now we're York with an O. We're always changing, always adapting. I firmly have a theory that by the year 2500, this will be the city of Y... That'll be it. Just a, just a Y. You know, like Prince. Got rid of all his extra names. Just shorned it down. Always making it nice and tight. Now, just here in front of me is the Jorvik Viking Centre. And this whole area 
used to be a sweet factory known as Cravens of York, and it was helmed by a woman named Mary Ann Craven, and their sweet factory reported absolutely bizarre goings-on right out of the gate. They started saying that things were being pushed off of shelves, uh, jars were flying across the factory floor, doors would slam. These days, the areas around here sometimes say the fire alarms will trigger. They say that people making their way into these shops will report uh, their, their telephones vibrating in their pockets and there'll be absolutely nothing there. They will hear strange, odd sounds, creaks of staircases, and it's all been attributed to a fellow known simply as Ivor the Boneless. Now, if you know your history, you'll know that Ivor the Boneless is one of the sons of Ragnar Lothbrok. Ragnar Lothbrok was a Viking war chief of absolute renown and terror. If you heard the name Lothbrok is coming, Lothbrok, Lothbrok is coming, you would just park yourself immediately. You'd have an awful time of it all. It was a, a name that would put fear and treachery and, 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 and absolute agony into the heart of the most hearty uh, Anglo-Saxon warrior. When you translate Lothbrok into modern English, it does lose the sting slightly. It comes out as like woolly trousers or hairy legs, something like that. You know, big hairy legs is coming. It's not, it's not quite got the same sting, but there it is. It wasn't even big hairy legs that came to York. It was his sons. It was half Dan and Ivor the Boneless, otherwise known as little hairy legs. It seemed funny for a little while. Then, you know, those people were killed in blood eagle sacrifices, heads on spikes, all manner of entrails pulled out with sharp hooks. It suddenly lost the, you know, novelty factor. Over the years, Ivor the Boneless, the Viking poltergeist of York, has actually reduced his activities. And these days, he haunts one single solitary shop. It's actually just up here. I'm just going to run back to it, leaving Mrs. Death on her own. In 2020, my friends, are you not ready for this? Ivor the Boneless haunts the body shop. Right there. See? See, he clearly had a, clearly had a sense of humour. Just took him a little while to realise it. The body shop. Uh, these are the jokes, friends. These are the jokes. Absolutely no regrets. I just ran up a street to do that. I'm not decided if it was worth it or not yet. Here we go. Marvellous. So we're going to make our way through now, through past Phoenix, through the site of the old... Uh, what was that? You waving? Just... Battery's gone on your phone, has it? She's got 5% on her phone. That's what her mind's doing. So we're about 15 minutes away from the end. If you have enjoyed this, please do... Uh, Throw us a like on the old Facebook page. Uh, feel free to leave a little review on Facebook, because I've picked up a few of those over the times, and I will be hopefully launching some kind of more rehearsed and articulate walks. I hope this has been clear and concise to some degree. As I said, I'm riffing most of it. I've got all the facts kind of noted down here and stuffed in my head. But it is a little bit uh, out of what I normally do. So normally I, I, I drive around on this old bus and we have a prescribed route, and... Um, they do lots of work with schools and, and education. Um, it's normally a little bit more prepared than this. This has perhaps been a little bit more flying in the, the face of the chaos of it all. But we're making our, excuse me, we're making our way now through towards the Castle Car Park, towards the York Castle, and of course, towards Clifford's Tower. So I'm gonna turn away from my face once again. Double tap, come on now. My fingers are so cold, they're not registering properly. Now, I'm not sure what the lighting situation is going to be like here, but as we come around the corner, you can see the courthouse there, you can see the castle itself, and there's Clifford's Tower. There's the money shot. Look at that. Boom. So the Vikings arrive in 866 AD, and they take a real shine to the place, and they decide they want to keep it for themselves. So what they do is they build a defensive mound right here, this big old hill. This is long before the stone tower appears. This is the late 800s. The idea being, the higher up you are, the easier it is to murder people trying to invade your city. Now, once again, this is Castle Car Park. This is normally chock-a-block with cars. And as, your moment, as you can see, there's only a handful. A few brave souls have ventured out into the night. But back to Clifford's Tower. The Vikings built a hill here. They built another one on the side of the River Ouse. The River Ouse is just there, beyond those buildings. The River Foss. Is just down there, tucked away behind those ones. The fork of the river, just over yonder, over the Castle Museum, where the River Ouse and the Foss combine. The Foss ceases to be, and the Ouse takes over entirely. And the idea was, as I say, the higher up you were, the easier it was to defend people. Now, I'm going to go this way around, because I can already hear there's an anti-youth alarm. And I'm very pleased to say, uh, approaching 40 years old, I can still hear the anti-youth alarm, so that says that I'm clearly looking after myself. I've got the lovely daffodils and flowers there. I'm not sure how many you can see in the current light. 
Now, William the Conqueror enters the situation in the 10 hundreds. He builds a wooden fort on top of this hill. It's the first example of the Mott and Bailey Castle. The Vikings knock it down. He builds another one the following year in 1070. The Vikings actually leave it alone in a rare act of compromise. You know, they weren't known for being the most civilised of people. We fast forward to the 1200s. They build the stone one here, using the same stones of the York Minster and the city walls. Now, it was never branded as a site of execution. It was used as a torture house, as a royal mint. It was used as a residence for the royal family of York to live in. Just going to flip round again. I've got fingers to work. Wait. Wait for it. Oh, this is terrible. Every time I press the screen, something really random happens. There we go. Come on. One moment. Do you know what? Where's the... I'm going to use that button instead. There we go. That's better. Got there in the end, didn't we? As I was saying, it was never actually sanctioned as a site of execution. Although a fellow named Robert Ask lost his life there in the 1500s. Now, what he did was he spoke out against King Henry VIII. King Henry VIII, long story short, decided he wanted to go off and, you know, have a little bit of that with someone that wasn't his wife. And as divorce didn't exist back in the olden times, he wrote a letter to the Pope asking for an annulment of marriage. This was, of course, poo-pooed. Told him to stick it right where the sun don't shine. Henry VIII was like, oh, I'm Henry VIII. I'm the richest, most powerful man in the country. I can do whatever the hell I like. So he did. He wrote his entire rule book just for himself. He actually wrote the Church of England, and with that came the dissolution of the monasteries, and with that came a lot of very angry people who decided that this was not the best move for the King of England to make. They actually had a fellow named Robert Asks, went down from York to London, stood in front of Henry VIII, and told him what he thought. This was not received well. He was branded a heretic and a traitor. I'm just trying to find a bit of light here. There we go. He was branded a heretic and a traitor. He was dragged in ropes and chains, and he was hanged in ropes and chains, I should say, from the outside of this very tower right here. Now, this is something they would do to you while you were alive. They left him there for 11 months and three weeks, a round trip of one full year. After that, they cut the body down. He was in an awful state. People have said that, as such, a supernatural residence has been left behind. People are making their way past these stones and hills. So they hear the sound of Robert Ask's voice calling out in horror. They hear the sound of him wailing in misery, like a low-hanging drone, a kind of echoing, ooh. Now, the problem here is that after 450 years of people being frightened of this terrifying noise, it was discovered that what this noise was, was the wind blowing through the windows, which was very embarrassing, very embarrassing indeed. For the best part of 450 years, the people of York were frightened of the breeze, which was quite humiliating indeed. Really, really bad times. And of course we have, I would say, the darkest moment of York's history here. Friday the 16th of March, 1190, 150 men, women and children of York's Jewish community sought refuge in this tower here. They've been attacked in their homes by a large part of the bulk religious community that lived here at the time and they actually set fire to the tower with these people inside they knew that they had no choice they could run they could flee into the night they'd be captured tortured executed what they actually did was they took their matters into their own hands and they took their own lives they actually started killing each other before they could be captured 150 people reduced to less than 10 in a matter of moments now some people have said that the stones of Clifford's tower the inside the steps have been marked by the blood of the innocent. There is a sort of reddish orange hue to some of the steps around this part. The people have said it's the blood of the innocent that was spilled on all those years ago. Again, like the windows and the howling winds, the uh, scary story was poo-pooed when we found out that what it actually was, was a mineral deposit of copper running through the stones, which isn't quite as frightening, all things considered. And now, friends, we're going to head into St. George's Field area of York. This is the site of my favourite story in the entire city of York. Now, I'm just going to be a bit careful here because there's some, there's some youths on bicycles and they're, they're eyeing me up. They see, a, they see a man with a selfie stick and a microphone and they think, fair game, fair game indeed. Now, this is the bit I wanted to go to. St. George's Field. Thank you, Mrs. Deathly around this part was actually used for public executions back in the 1800s. We started executing people here in York around 1379, publicly. 
out of the Knavesmire. Knavesmire of York is a hanging ground out near the race course where the Tyrese Chocolate Factory currently stands and it's incredibly popular. You've got to remember at the height of industry it was absolute entertainment people would come from miles around just to watch executions take place and this site was no different this was one of the last standing sites of executions here in York before they made them private before they took them away from public eye and they started executing people behind closed doors inside of the castle now this story actually goes back to the middle of the 1800s a fella named William Dove William Dove was from a very wealthy family here in York, the Leeds area. And he actually really liked to drink. He loved to drink. He loved to spend his nights away in bars and taverns. And it's in those bars and taverns where William Dove met a man by the name of Harry Henrinson. And what happened here was he introduced himself as the Leeds Wizard. Now, how alarm bells didn't start ringing there, I genuinely have no idea. If a man walks up to me, in the middle of a pub and introduce himself as the Leeds Wizard. I'm going to start asking a few questions, truth be told. Now we convinced William Dove that if his wife Harriet was to die, he would meet a more beautiful and financially stable woman. And he went for it hook, line and sinker. He genuinely believed this was the only option that he had. Now his wife Harriet was actually quite sickly. And William Dove started introducing strychnine into her medicine. He would apply this by putting a small bit on his thumb rubbing it on the underside of the cork, popping the cork back in the bottle and shaking it before administering it to her. He'd been told that strychnine would be untraceable when he found out that the doctors were going to perform an autopsy and that strychnine was indeed very traceable. He began to panic, he began to freewheel, he began to, to free fall into, into madness and he actually began to claim his only line of defence for poisoning his wife was a wizard made me do it. Weirdly, this didn't work. And because he was from a very wealthy family, word got around and 20,000 people gathered here. 20,000 people gathered here around the St. George's Field area to watch William Dove be hanged just over the road there, the site of the old York Castle. Now, even in those final moments, he held fast. His only real line of defence was, a wizard made me do it. Again, not the best strategy. 20,000 people is an insane number. Now we have all manner of public events here in York. We try all sorts to get people to come into the city. 20,000 is good innings. To give you context, 2019, Rod Stewart played at the race course. 30,000 came to York and the city broke. We couldn't, couldn't, just, we couldn't contend with that volume of people. I've often said, often met with some dark looks. Imagine how many people would come out for it if we hanged Rod Stewart here in York. I'm not saying we should. I'm not saying we should. I'm just saying, you know, you've got to be creative in these difficult times. Now, when they hanged him, it wasn't the smoothest. When you're going to hang someone by the neck, you're normally going to want to put the noose around the neck. You want to make them drop about yay high. A couple of feet. The noose will pull tight with a wet snap. The weight of the body will take them off. In the case of William Dove, he said that he struggled and gasped for about 15 to 20 minutes. Awful way to go. And that's where the haunting comes into it. People making their way through St George's Field, underneath the ironworks of the bridges behind me. They often say that they see him, William Dove's spirit, hanging out up high in the trees, perched there, staring down at them. They say that they see him up high in the metalworks of the old bridge there. They hear a soft, scuffling sound. The sounds of a man's feet trying desperately to uh, gather purchase. They look up into the rafters and they actually see the soles of William Dove's feet, still splattered with dirt and mud, desperately, agonisingly, trying to grasp hold for purchase. Oh, spooky times, my friend, spooky times. Well, I think that's about me. I'm very cold. Mrs. Deathly here appears to have shut down. She's dressed like Kenny from South Park, but like a sort of evil-looking version of him. I'm going to sign off now, and I hope you've enjoyed yourself with me tonight. I hope you're safe and sound. I hope that you're secure and positive. Keep looking after yourself. Keep taking care. As I say, if you have enjoyed this, if you've... Uh, 
learn anything, be horrified by anything. Don't, don't, don't be silly. York's wonderful. When the sun's up and it's nice and hustling and bustling, it's a fantastic place to be. But do like the page. Do comment on this, whatever. Leave little reviews on the Facebook thing. I'll be posting up a link to the PayPal if you feel the urge to chuck a few quid my way. Um, go for it. Why not? It'll all help. It'll all add up. Tea and coffee fund. We got a house. I like the house. I'd like to be living in the house by the end of it. Uh, I've got a few creative ideas, as I'm sure we all do in these bizarre and difficult times. But I thought I'd do something rather than sit at home and feel sorry for myself. But that's me, Dorian Deathly. Bizarre and twisted tour guide of York saying thank you very much for joining me. I'm staggered by how many people turned out. Absolutely over the moon with that. I will leave this video up for a couple of days and then take it down. Because obviously it's a little bit ragged and um, unprepared to what I normally do. I think I've been waffling on for what time is it now? She's looking slowly at the phone. 90, it's an hour and 15 there. That's an hour and 15 of some hardcore, ghostly, horrible knowledge. But yeah, I'm done. I'm going to sign off. Cheers, guys. Take care. Look after yourselves.